Welcome to Unexpected Points. I'm your host, Kevin Cole. I'm joined again by Matthew Freeman. I needed to find someone uh, a real who has a real sickness. And this guy, this guy has a sickness for, for draft props. And let's face it, the draft is great. Mock drafts are great. Everything else is great. But, you know, let, let's, let, let's put some money down on the line here. You know, it's all talk. Talk is cheap. And uh, this is a guy who... We're going to go through the whole draft, uh, first round sort of, sort of ish. What, what, what may happen? I'm going to try to keep him to some of the major themes here because I know if I let Matt go for too long, we'll be betting on over under players drafted from teams with feline mascots or something like that at a certain point here. So we're going to try to tr- try to narrow it down there and discuss some news that's gone on recently. So Matt, uh, welcome to the show once again. I know. I, I think this is my third time on the show. I'm basically so, yeah. the co-host at this point. <laughs> I, what, I, might have, I like that. Yeah. Unpaid labor is what is yeah. what we call it here in yeah. the, in the biz. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're used to it. We're used to it. We we had years of it grinding early on, uh, and so I don't mind returning to unpaid labor once again with someone I used to be in the trenches with. Yeah. Yeah. So we, uh, I've been listening. You got you had a great podcast that came out. Uh, I don't know, it was yesterday probably with Chris Raybon. Um, and also, uh, who's, who's your third code host? Sean Corner. Oh yeah. And, Sean Corner, uh, right. Scott and, Smith joined us. It was, yeah, it was oh, fantastic. Yes. Yeah. So that was good. You guys walked through all this. You had some good obscure plays there. Some of the things people on opposing side of a few things. And I think we're going to want to discuss that when it comes to some running back questions, some other questions. I have some, some theories on these. Now I've been a little bit less rigorous going through this. So I want to talk about some of your ways of looking at the process because you know, as, as much as I like to be very processes oriented about everything, when it comes to some of these draft props, often I'm just like finding players who I like and assuming they're all going to go earlier than they should, which is probably not the way it's going to go. Or I'm building in some sort of galaxy brain take of all these different trades that'll happen. And then this one player will fall to them. But I think the important part here is, I mean, maybe it'll start from, from the top when you're trying to figure out which props that you like. Often, you know, you hear it quoted and you hear the the American odds being quoted plus 200, minus 150, this and that. I mean, all of this, at least in my mind, I always want to convert all that into probability. But then again, how do you think about probabilities in this very uncertain environment? Uh, yeah, so I do the exact same thing where I, I think like, okay, this, uh, this prop is plus 200. That means it has a 33% chance of hitting. Uh, and so I always think of these things probabilistically. And part of it is I have my index of mock drafts. You know, I, I've kind of curated this index based on uh, sharp mocks, like guys who've been predictive year over year uh, across a number of different competitions. And so, you know, I think they tend to be predictive. In fact, let me rephrase that. I know, I know that they are predictive. So that's one resource. And then, you know, guys who are insiders in the league, you know, Adam Schefter, if he says something, I can go back and quantify. And I've, you know, kind of half-heartedly attempted to do this, like go back and quantify like Schefter's hit rate when he says something. And like, I've also tried to, to go back and quantify like the type of language that Schefter uses. So like, if he says, this is going to happen, like what is Schefter's hit rate on something like that versus him saying like, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, like what is Schefter's hit rate on that? So like, you can actually quantify some of this and, you know, with the index, I, I can quantify it. And then I've sort of learned with that index, what degree of groupthink there tends to be across mock drafts. And then sometimes I'll make, you know, manual adjustments to where like, if 90% of mocks are saying this, it's probably more like 80%. Uh, And so you just, you know, it's, there's a lot of art. There's a lot of subjectiveness in the process, but I still try to have it grounded in numbers. Yeah. Now, now figuring out who you can build more confidence into in their opinions, I think is, I think is important because, Let's face it, like the NFL, and we see from the silliness that we have at the top of the draft where teams don't even reveal who they're drafting, even though everyone knows they're going to draft, <laughs> there's there's certainly an element of wanting to keep some surprise there, right? Like you want those Jets fans on the edge of their seat, despite the fact that, you know, there's a lot of wink and nods and, and whatever. And I, th- I think Douglas said that so-and-so predicted they were taking Wilson and, oh yeah, he's pretty plugged in on what's going on at, at BYU. So he, he acknowledged that it's probably going to happen, but he didn't say it was going to happen. Yeah. Right. Um, and then it was we come Steve to the... Young. It was Steve oh, Young Steve who Young. was saying, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's definitely, he's more than plugged in there. So, so, and then with the third pick, 
this is going to be the big discussion, and and we'll we'll get to that. I mean, that may be the we'll, obviously there'll be a lot of talk about that because that's I think that's the inflection point of of the entire draft for a lot of different things that are going on there. The third and fourth picks. Um, I have some strong opinions about what's going to happen there, and I think it may align some of with what you think is going to happen there. Um, but when you talk about what what Schefter has said, so he initially, and I, I did, I, I went back and forth with some people on this. So he said, I believe he said he would be shocked. Is, is that the first thing he said if he wasn't going to be Mac Jones? Now, that's a stronger statement than that everyone was playing back to a clip that he had where he said he would be surprised if Sam Darnold was not still the quarterback. Um, but that was way early in the offseason. That was, I think, Robert Sala may have may not even been hired at that point, everything that was going on there. So yeah. to me, I put those in totally different categories. Yeah. One is more like speculation. One, if you're going to say shocked, is a different thing. But now, most recently, Schefter is saying that you know, they went through the process. It's the same thing that Shanahan was saying in, in the press conference yesterday, which, again, we'll, we'll get into, uh, not only for facts, but for some of the hilarity of it, um, th- that, you know, they knew they wanted one guy, then they started start st- studying other guys, and now it could be multiple guys. I'm wondering, I kind of discount some of this stuff as we're going into the draft, because I feel like there is more of an incentive, I believe, at this point to add some mystery to something rather than walking in and being even more specific at this point when everyone kind of believes X is going to happen anyway. Yeah, they have no incentive to reveal what they're doing, and they might have some incentive to obfuscate. So, yeah, I mean, you don't know for sure, you know, what they're doing or why they're going to do it, but I think it's going to be Mac Jones. Um, and, And Schefter, yeah, early on, he said he expected it to be Mac Jones, And then shortly after that, he was on ESPN radio and he outright said, it will be Mac Jones. And then about uh, five days later, he walked it back with, if they were making the pick right now, this is what they would do, but they're going through the process. They're evaluating all these quarterbacks. And that is around the time when the market started to swing back towards Justin Fields as the favorite. But um, throughout that whole process, Almost everyone who's plugged into the NFL has been saying that they're leaning Mac Jones. And if it's not Mac Jones, it's Trey Lance. And I mean, we see that now reflected in the markets. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it's starting to come through now. There was some fluctuation back and forth, although it seemed like every time there was a fluctuation away from Jones, there was never really nothing behind it. It was like how Kyle Shanahan smiled at Justin yes. Fields during <laughs> during there, a during a, no a pro one. day. There was yeah. no one who's really plugged in, you know, like there were, there were some people who I respect uh, who are good, you know, mock drafters who might have some connections here or there, but no one who's like a quote unquote NFL insider who was outright saying Justin Fields is the front runner. You know, everyone else was saying it's, it's between Jones and it's between Lance. And I mean, I still strongly lean towards Jones at this point. Okay, so the question, okay, again, we'll, we'll, we'll get into some of this process stuff maybe as we go through these picks is a better way of doing it. So the question then is going to be, how do you play this? Um, ideally, you know, you would have been on this uh, uh, when one of those fluctuations happened back towards fields, or you would have been on it immediately when the the Schefter first, when the first quotes came out on that. But, you know, we, we, we don't have a time machine here. So we're, we're not going, we're not going back and doing that. We can only look at what we got now. Uh, I mean, I'm seeing Jones at about, minus 250 here. So again, to translate that stuff, that's about a two thirds probability that he is going to be the pick according to the implied odds there. So you'd have to think there's a better chance than that. So you have that. Um, If you wanted to play one, two, three, like like a whole grouping of those, I think I've seen that at around the same amount. I'm not sure if you're getting any value there. So just how would you look at, at playing this um, if that was the choice, because again, those, those first two picks are so locked in. I don't know if there's any better way to play it um, than to just say he will be the third pick. So right now, I, I should say, because I'm a, a company man, we have a, yes. a props tool uh, at Action Labs where we import all of the odds from different books. And then I put my implied probability. So you can see in the tool, if I think there's an edge on a bet. And right now I have it projected, I believe around 70% that I think it's, uh, it's fields, sorry, that it's, uh, it's Jones. I probably need to adjust that more, but, you know, based on my projection right now, like there's no value 
in the market. What I would say is that from a, a market-based perspective, if you bet a line now, and the best line I'm seeing right now is minus 250 Mac Jones to go number three at FanDuel. Maybe there's a better line out there, but that's probably one of the best lines. Um, it's going to move even more. The closer we get to the draft, that line will move more. It will be minus 500 in a day or so. It might be minus a thousand the day of the draft. And so, you know, just from a closing line perspective, uh, if you want to bet Jones, go ahead and bet it now because you're never going to have a better chance. Yeah. And I think that um, when we go back to this, this press conference, so for those who didn't see, uh, the quote that got out there a lot was that uh, Kyle Shanahan said that he was comfortable with five different quarterbacks at the number three pick, which, um, I mean, first of all, I, I, let me just back up. So so the press conference was Lynch, and it was Shanahan talking. It was just very, the, the mood, at least when I watched it, was kind of very uncomfortable. It was not like, this is a team that just traded up to the number three pick. They're going to get their franchise quarterback. And if anything, it was, they were just on the defensive the entire time. There was a lot of talk about the reaction, about trusting them, about, uh, you know, we'll have to see years down the road how this goes. You know, you like to have everyone love the pick, but you can't be influenced by that fact. I mean, it was just saying we're taking Mac Jones over yeah, and over exactly. and over again. Unless someone thinks people are going to be upset by Trey Lance. I don't think people will be as upset about no. Trey Lance. No. Um, but what I didn't get from their perspective, and this has nothing to do with, with draft props, is like, why not just come in and say, there's one guy we wanted, we went up to get him, and we're going to get him. You know, going into the draft, the the, the, the team is going to, everyone's going to have an opinion, everyone's going to say something. Once that pick has been made, fans come home. They, they come home, and they they start to say, you know what, we got this guy. He 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 has one good clip during training camp. People are going to be like, oh, wait, maybe this guy is better than we thought. You know, you should have trusted Kyle Shanahan, you blah, blah, blah. You know, like, like just own it. I don't know why... He wasn't owning it because then you just sound like an idiot for trading up to the third pick if you're comfortable with all these different guys, especially because Mac Jones has not been linked really to any other team. So that the cost of three first round picks sounds enormous. He was another, another thing he said there was he said, well, if you would have liked to pick at 12, you should like to pick at three. No, that's not, that's not, that's he, he's not the guy who works. bets big favorites on the NFL every Sunday. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not how it works, guy. I'm sorry. Like that, you, you, uh, Whoever, and then the whole thing about whether Garoppolo would be there or not, because we don't know if anyone will be alive, so we don't know if Garoppolo <laughs> would be there. Like, somewhat, do they have a PR department? Do they have a PR over at the 49ers? Well, Shannon, like, you know, I got this. I, I, I've worked right. out all these answers because he was just very upset. I, I, he looked like someone who was just tilting. He was tilting on social media. He, yeah. He's been radicalized, basically, at, at this yeah. point. I, I think a big part of the problem is that I don't think Lynch agrees with the pick. And I think that's, well, that's the reporting lot... on it. That's reporting yeah. on it. And he, yeah, I mean, I, I put a clip in there and, and whatever, you know, I was trying to be a uh, kind of a dick where I put it out there saying that, you know, this is Lynch, like basically assigning all the blame to Shanahan when he said, you know, you have a quarterback, you have to trust him. And now it's now when you look over what Shanahan has done um, in that role, I think everyone points back to the Joe Williams pick where Peter uh, King was behind the scenes back in 2016 and kind of showed how, he pulled him off of the draft board to trade up to, to go get him. Um, Jarek McKinnon, I think that pretty much had a lot of Shanahan on it where they were yeah. bidding against nobody to, to give him a big contract. Some other things that have happened. So I think he's been bad. And I think this just like really illustrates how bad his process is because his process is if I want X quarterback, you just get him and who cares how much it costs? Who cares who else was going to draft him? Who cares about anything, basically? Yeah, I, I think Shanahan is probably very good at creating a system that uh, makes ordinary guys look great. And I think he's probably good at evaluating talent and figuring out how that works within his system. But I don't think from a market-based perspective, he's good at uh, the valuation of those players in, in sort of like in a poker perspective, thinking about like what, what the odds are that this guy is going to go at a certain round or what the odds are that this guy is going to fetch $20 million on the open market. And so you have to beat that number. Like, I don't think he's very good in that sort of like business of football type of sense. Yeah. And it seems like this also for the Mac Jones thing, 
I mean, maybe the whiteboard and things like that, uh, those are more important things than I think they are. But in my opinion, like being able to recall a play is great. Yeah, coaches can do that, right? Like I bet Sean McVay, you know, he, he can do that. Shanahan can do that. Maybe guys like Peyton Manning, I'm sure, can, can do that sort of stuff. I mean, Brett Favre didn't know what nickel defense was, right? So there's like, there's there's a thing <laughs> about just having a lot, a lot of talent. And like processing during a course of a play is just instinctual. I don't know if a quarterback could even tell you what they're what they're doing out there necessarily as they're going through it and explain it in that sort of manner. So this whole thing of Shanahan kind of like drafting himself or wanting to put someone out there, he's kind of like, if I could upgrade my body to be a little bit yeah. better and then put myself out there. But I don't think that's the way it works. I think you want to try to get some extraordinary yeah. talent in that position. I, I agree. Here's the thing. I so I, I'm of two minds of this. One, I think from a process perspective, it was ridiculous to trade up to three uh, if they want Mac Jones. Trading up to six probably would have been sufficient and would have cost them a lot less. Trading to seven or eight probably still would have worked. But anyway, so on the one hand, I think it's totally ridiculous what they gave away. On the other hand, I do think Jones will probably have success in that system because a lot of quarterbacks have success in that system. And I think Jones out of the quarterbacks that Shanahan is going to have actually might be the best of them. Like maybe he's not as good as Matt Ryan, uh, you know, like thinking about like their peak, he's probably not going to be as good as Ryan was in that MVP season. But aside from that, like Jones could probably be not in year one, but you know, in years three through six, he could probably be an above average, let's say like top eight, like eight to 12 NFL quarterback, like that could be good enough for them to win some Super Bowls. Like, I, I don't think it's a horrendous decision to take him for the system. If you're doing it at a spot that makes sense, it's just that they're, they're ridiculous in what they gave up to get him. Yeah, I mean, I was actually a little bit higher before this trade on what Jimmy Garoppolo could potentially do this year because of the yes. fact that, you know, they they got they got Trent Williams there. They have Kittle, who will hopefully be healthy. They have Debo Samuel. We, we had the foot injury last year. He'll hopefully be, be healthy. Brandon Ayuk looks pretty good. I mean, this is kind of like the best offense that Jimmy yes. Garoppolo was going to have. And now and now they're they're switching gears. So we'll see if Jimmy Garoppolo, uh, you know, hopefully uh, makes it to the beginning of the season. <laughs> makes it to the beginning of the season. We don't see any tragic accidents there uh, uh, for, for Jimmy there. So I think that's interesting. And one other thing I want to talk about in the Mac Jones discussion, and I think this is where people get a little bit off on the quarterback. Like you can have something where you can confidently say something is like almost a hundred percent the wrong decision, but that does not mean there's a zero percent chance that. Mac Jones is better than someone else, right? I mean, you can say 100% of the time you should take uh, Trevor Lawrence over Mac Jones. That doesn't mean that 100% of the time Trevor Lawrence is going to be better th than Mac Jones. So I think that's an important way also of looking at it. And when people try to dunk on people later on for what the results end up end up happening, that's not what we're saying. You can have an obvious, obvious, obvious decision, and you can't justify that by saying, well, there's a chance this guy will be better because that's always right. the case. Right, exactly. So, like, I mean, not to bring this back to poker all the time, because it's not as if I even play poker, I'm, like, right at it. But I, I think <laughs> it's it's good for, like, analogies. Like, in a poker hand, like, if you're 99% to win a hand, that means like a hundred percent of the time, you know, like you should be, you should be going forward with uh, like with playing out the hand, right. Even though, you know, you're going to lose 1% of the time. So yeah, it's like a similar thing. Uh, you should always take Trevor Lawrence over Mac Jones, even though 1% of the time Mac Jones is going to have a better NFL career. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a good, that's a good way of looking. I mean, I have Jones rated below the other guy just because he's a one year sort of guy, not even digging into a lot of the physical trait stuff. Cause I don't think he's maybe as bad as, as some people think there. Um, but well, we'll, we'll see going forward. So, so that's their number four pick. Um, again, this is another one where I was leaning more heavily towards Kyle Pitts for a while now. And I think the market is kind of starting to, to price that in a lot more. Do you see anything there? I think you're also on on pits here for for going there um what what's the way to to play that is to play it to the falcons is to play it his over under what, what are you looking at yeah i think his over under and there's one sports book let me actually kind of make sure this is still applicable uh i believe that right now he is uh plus 210 which is a ridiculous number under four and a half so um and that's at the score so you just kind of have to assume that he's going to go number four. Um, but I mean, I think it's 
you know, better than a 50% chance or maybe a, just a 50% chance that he goes number four, but a plus 210 odds, that's fantastic value. Uh, but I, I think he's locked in at number four uh, because I think the Falcons really kind of screwed the leverage that they would have had. If teams thought that maybe they would take a quarterback, they would have been more incentivized to trade up. I think Atlanta, in theory, would like to trade down. I just don't know if they're going to be able to when teams know that they're not going to take a quarterback. They know Cincinnati's not going to take a quarterback. And so why trade up to four when you can trade up to six, right? And so I think Atlanta is probably going to be stuck there. And all indications are, if they are there, they're not going to take the successor to Matt Ryan. And I think that would be Trey Lance instead of Justin Fields. But they're going to go with who they think is the best pass catching talent. And that's Kyle Pitts, who really fits in well with the two tight end system that Arthur Smith likes to run. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I love all of that there. Uh, you know, new regime coming in there. I also think this is a situation where the way draft evaluation works is going to lean things toward taking pits. I mean, it's uh, positional value is not the same, but I see this a little bit similarly to like when Saquon Barkley was coming out in 2018, where there's a possibility that when you're grading these guys, all these teams do this, they grade them on like a one to nine scale. They line them up there. They think about these different things. Kyle Pitts is going to be like a nine. He's going he's gonna be like the yeah. freak, the best you've ever seen at this position, similar to, like I said, how Barkley and how Gettleman, now Gettleman aside, you know, Gettleman <laughs> right. said he wasn't even yeah. entertaining offers there because of the fact that he's so high. So just the way that the draft system works inside these, these draft rooms, when you have the rankings, he's going to be sitting there where I can see a team saying, you know what, we can go back a few spots, but at that point, uh, we're going to be looking at maybe Chase is gone, maybe Sewell is gone, maybe these other guys are gone. I, I think teams have soured on Sewell and some of these guys also. So they're saying, you know, we're going to be jumping from a nine prospect maybe to an eight or to a what, whatever it may be. And for that reason, you know what, let's just stick there. We got Matt Ryan. I don't think Julio Jones is going to be traded because I don't think they can get enough for him. At 32 years old, um, they were a year late if they were going to try to trade him. Not that he was yeah. bad last year, but he only played nine games. Um, and people are not going to want to jump in front of a potential, you know, train wreck in that regard. So, so I think everyone's going to be there, and they're going to say, let's let's push forward for the next for the next couple of years. Uh, Arthur Smith is is probably not going to want to take a year off either, and necessarily say we're going to do a, a new quarterback rebuild type of type of situation. So, yeah. uh, for all those reasons, I think Pitts is the one guy in this class, the one non quarterback where a team can definitively say we're, we're like, we're just not going to move back, even if we could get some value here. Yeah. And, you know, check, check your numbers out there. There might be value on, um, on Pitts as the first non-quarterback drafted in the class. Yeah. I mean, that would be pretty, I mean, that'd be amazing also for a tight end to, to, to go there. I think we saw, I guess it was Vernon Davis was the fifth pick, but he was number six. He was oh, six. six. I think, I think there were three or four non-quarterbacks taken in that draft. Uh, Kellen Winslow, I guess you can go back to him. He was in the, he was right at the top of the draft. I mean, Mike, Mike Ditka is number five, like <laughs> Ditka, going back in the go day. Way, right. way, way, way back. back. He, he's the highest drafted tight end in NFL history. And honestly, maybe the greatest tight end in NFL history. Like as a rookie, he had the greatest tight end season to that point, uh, in NFL history, hall of famer. I mean, that's the kind of prospect we're talking about with Kyle Pitts of thinking of like, this guy could be the highest drafted tight end in, in history. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how quickly he can acclimate himself to the NFL. But you figure like Julio, Ridley, Pitts, Hayden Hurst doing whatever Hayden Hurst does. Um, <laughs> this could be nice for, for Matt Ryan. You know, maybe some, some low-key I think Matt that Ryan, offense 80 could to be 1 great. MVP. And, 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 and by odds. the way, they, have, they are right in the wheelhouse to take a running back at the top of round two, like whether it's Etienne who falls to them or Javante Williams, a lot of people are high on him. Like they could take a very good running back at the top of round two. And like, generally I think it's like, okay, why take a running back that high? But like, that's something they could do. And if they do that, their offense looks totally different. Like all of a sudden you look at the skill position players they have, and it's like, that could be a pretty exciting offense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, well, I have some running back thoughts that we'll we'll talk about, which could be a little counterintuitive than what most people might think my running back thoughts would be. Um, but we'll get into that a little bit later. So now this is this pick here, the fifth, the fifth pick, or what may happen here. God, it's one of those things where I just don't know. The rumors are ownership wants uh, Jamar Chase here. 
And like I said, I think there's been some souring on Penny Sewell or, or you know, the, the difference between he and, and Slater may not be that big. So there's a little bit of conflation there. Um, but, God, I, like, another thing I'm wondering about here is, I think this is an important part, is like, where does the next quarterback go? And is there any chance the Bengals trade out of this pick? I haven't heard about them moving, which makes me think maybe they're really, really locked on on Chase. Like, maybe they really don't even want to except like I would take a first round pick maybe lose chase and then just look to see who else is there I would totally do that but maybe that maybe we just think they're not going to do that they have no chance of doing it what what's your opinion because that? that could be the thing that could throw off chase yeah. in some in my opinion maybe even more than going with another player so what what I see in mock drafts and then what I've heard from a guy who knows a guy for whatever right. that's worth <laughs> it's, it's total Saul Goodman uh, all right well now I have a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy yeah uh, what, what I've heard is that the the coaches and the scouts wanted Sewell, which makes yeah. sense, like protect your quarterback. And of course, uh, you have Joe Burrow in there petitioning for his number one college wide receiver and ownership overruled the coaching staff and they don't want to disappoint their franchise quarterback. So they are going with Jamar Chase, like they are locked in with Chase, even if the Falcons traded down and a quarterback went number four and Kyle Pitts were available. I think they would still go with Jamar chase. Like, I think this is a very locked in pick it's chase. Even if they had the opportunity to trade down, I don't think they want to disappoint their quarterback. Like he wants his guy and, and that's chase. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, if, if he wants it, it makes sense. Also I think the ownership angle is really, really important. In fact, for the Falcons, we got a little hint um, a few weeks ago about ownership wanting to stick with Matt Ryan. I mean, for yeah. me, that was like alarm signals were going off when that happened because I kind of assumed that Arthur Smith w- may also want to stick with, with Matt Ryan because coaches want to win uh, yeah. immediately also. So those two things coming together, ownership is huge. O- ownership wins. I mean, they, they you know, they, they pay the bills. They run the show. Um, so it, it comes down to it. Everything has to be cleared by those by those guys and they have to be on board and if so the quarterback and a lot of these teams also kind of becomes like a de facto stakeholder in a lot of these decisions too so those two things make sense now um so so that again so that if we're looking there at how you play this is this a to the Bengals? is this a over under on chase uh, what what do you think i don't think there's much value in the market now on chase because this is pretty assumed now that he's going to the Bengals. And so whether it's the over under a five and a half or six and a half, uh, or whether it's, um, you know, chase to the Bengals, you can bet that, but I don't think there's any value in the market there. Interesting. Now, uh, okay. So there are a couple of different things as we're going through this, um, on a team by team basis that we also have to think about. One is like, where do these quarterbacks go next? Right. When yeah. we're thinking about where they're going to go in the top 10, um, it on the, the Schefter podcast, the earlier this week, the, there's one quote that got a decent amount of play, and that was his talking about exactly what Shanahan reiterated about liking different quarterbacks and everyone moving up. But another thing Shanahan said, just to go back to the Mac Jones thing really quickly, he also said our number one guy. He said every he said players moved up as part of the process, like other. He also said our number one guy also moved up. So again, it's like Mac Jones, like you're not gonna yeah. not take the number one guy yeah. who got better according to yeah. your evaluation, right? Um, anyway. Uh, probably spend enough time, enough time beating that one to death, especially when it comes out to be someone else. And then we have to uh, backtrack everything there. So, 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 so he also sees, he said 95% chance in his mind that fields would still be there at pick number six. But when they said, what was the probability according to ESPN's modeling on mock drafts was like an 80 something percent chance that uh, Lance would be there. And he's like, oh, I think it's a lot lower, a lot lower than 85% chance. So what do you think about Lance? I think that's an interesting one where, again, like, do we know what the Dolphins are, are going to do? I mean, they move back up to six. So that makes me think it'd be weird if they move back down. But like, I don't really, I don't really understand. I don't understand what the Dolphins are doing, basically. Yeah. Because everyone's talking about them maybe moving down. But then why did you move up if you're going to move down? So uh, a couple thoughts here. And let's talk about the the Schefter quote. And so he yeah. said a lot of it with uh, with Lance comes down to what San Francisco does. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then there's also, you know, the possibility, uh, remote possibility, but possibility that Atlanta takes a quarterback. If they do, 
I think that's Lance and not Fields. Okay. Uh, and then so you think it's course, more about that than it is about someone else coming up to get them. Well, I, no, but then at number six, there is the possibility yeah. that a team will come back up. Um, what what is interesting about Miami, like they are looking pass catcher. And at the time when they traded up, they, I believe, were under the assumption that one way or another, either four quarterbacks would go ahead of them, or maybe they would see Panay Sewell go in the top five. And then that would mean that either, either Kyle Pitts or Jamar Chase would fall to them. Also, because they weren't trading up in the heat of the moment, they weren't like trading up specifically for a quarterback. They didn't have uh, as much like of a pressing need to move up. And so like, I think they were able to move up without like paying away everything in the draft. Now, if a team wants to move up for a quarterback, I bet that the dolphins will be able to get more for the number six pick than the Eagles got for the number six pick in that trade, because the the quarterback needy team will just press more and probably force themselves to give away more in trading up. So I don't think the Dolphins necessarily made a, a massive mistake in trading back up to six. They're giving themselves the optionality of taking one of the two elite pass catchers if that guy slides down to them, or the option of also trading to another team that needs a quarterback and maybe getting more than they gave away to move up. If they stay at number six, I don't think they take Sewell. Uh, I think they probably take a wide receiver. And the real question there. Is it Devontae Smith or is it Jalen Waddle? A lot of sharp people are leaning towards Waddle. I kind of lean a little more towards Smith, but I, I, it's a coin flip. Really, I think that's a coin flip. Yeah, because, okay, so that whole trade with the Eagles, just it doesn't make sense to me in like a number of different ways. Number one, if you were the Eagles, why not? Why don't you sit there and be in the catbird seat here to potentially trade back out and, and get that sort of ransom? So they must have thought that, Maybe they, they're hearing the field stuff is, is, is being a guy who's going to slip down and no one's going to trade up for him. So therefore, they decided they, they thought this was the best return that they could get on it. Um, again, like I said with Miami, like you figure from Miami's perspective, they ran out their scenario planning and they thought to themselves, maybe they, didn't, they weren't targeting six. Maybe they couldn't get to five. They couldn't get to four. Um, but they, the, maybe even the, the, the Lions don't want to leave. So they said, and the, and the Eagles are always game. And so then they decided, well, we'll go there and we're going to get one of X number of guys that are going to be there. Now, I guess, okay, this is this is no knowledge of, of anything, which is kind of how I do, <laughs> which probably isn't the best way to, to preface what I'm about to say here. But, um, like, if I look at Tua Tungavailoa and the type of player he is, like, I do kind of like Waddle there only because if you think about when we watched him play, his problem was – in, in his first year, he was not like willing to to throw to covered guys. That was when Fitzpatrick just came in and was doing, you know, just throwing up back shoulders, was doing other things, this and that. He was a little bit less willing to do that. He's he's a little bit more of maybe like a yak quarterback if he can if he can get those guys. So I just feel like Waddle fits into there. Now looking at when they played at Alabama together, uh, Waddle kind of had a down year during um, during Tungavailoa's last season, but. Uh, Waddle's freshman season, when Tonga Vailoa really dominated and was and was the guy there, like he had a pretty good freshman year. He had more he had more production than Devontae Smith did that year. So I do think there's a chance for Waddle there. Um, and there's also buzz about Waddle. Now, this is how much you believe that. I've seen some some plugged in guys like this guy, Eric Galco, who just got who's just like the shrine game. He's gonna take over being the player personnel there. He's plugged in a bunch of teams. He says and he was early on Kyler Murray uh, um, a couple of years ago as being the number one pick. He says that there are a lot of teams that have Waddle at number one on their board. Now, that that it, 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 that doesn't mean he's going to go number one, right, because we have the Bengals there. But I do wonder about the, the, the buzz is clearly positive on Waddle and negative on, on Devontae Smith. That's that's correct. I I think what matters, though, is what the Dolphins think. Right. You know, and – just as in uh, Jamar Chase was the number one wide receiver for Joe Burrow, you know, Devontae Smith was the number one receiver for Tua. And I think if they have to choose between one of those guys, I, like I think Waddle is the better prospect. Um, I think more teams across the board have him as the higher rated player. But if I had to choose between which one of those guys will go number six to the Dolphins, 
I would lean towards Smith right now. And like, there's room for me to change my mind on that. Fortunately, we have a, a couple of days left till the draft and when I have to submit my final mock. But right now, I lean towards Smith. Okay, because that, so that's interesting because if you look at Waddle, his numbers versus Devontae Smith. So I'm looking at some of these here. I mean, you, you may have some other some other numbers here, but it looks like the numbers are a little bit like the, the, the numbers are clearly according to these over under saying that the, they're they're a little bit more positive on the fact that that Waddle will go earlier, I think by about a pick you or can, so. Yeah, you can um, look even at um at DraftKings right now. They have a head to head matchup between Waddle and Smith. Okay. And Waddle is a minus 167 favorite. Smith is plus 133. And in the big picture, I kind of agree with that. But I think if it comes down to the Dolphins at number six and who they're going to pick, if they stay there, I think the Dolphins are going receiver. And I, I think it comes down to the two of them. I would lean towards Smith. And I, I should just also say, based on the you know the mock draft data that I look at, Smith has a small lead right now over Waddle. Like that could easily change when more mock drafts come in and the market is clearly leaning towards Waddle right now. I do think it's pretty close to a coin flip between these guys. Like honestly, plus 133 for Devontae Smith to go ahead of Jalen Waddle. I think there's some value there. Yeah, yeah. And again, if we're going to put this in terms of like probability it's basically we're talking about like a 60 40 type type of split is where is where that's going at and the one thing I'll say about I'll say about Smith and I think it plays into fields a little bit too is that when it comes to the mock draft industrial complex is that like there's a certain contingent of people who are almost offended by the thought that these guys are falling and they just dig in their heels like they really yeah. some people really dug in on fields I think people have dug in on Devonte Smith I mean you should see how many times uh, fantasy nerds or analytics people are getting dunked on just for mentioning the fact that the guy has some red flags, right? Like, I mean, he's right. he's, he's yeah. like, I weigh more than, than this guy. Um, he's he's a senior, all these sort of things. Like, he right. was only projected probably to be a second-round pick last year. Why didn't he come out last year? People are like, well, maybe he wanted to go back to school. No, I, please, come on. If he was first-round <laughs> pick, he was coming out. Like, Don't, stop. Uh, so, like, all these other things. So I do think there is a little bit of digging in and – you know, there's the potential for for mock drafters to be behind the curve on what's going on here because they, even though they'll yell at you for questioning the NFL, they also will not believe the the feedback that yeah. they're hearing from the NFL on things. Yes. Yeah. So I will say, I think Smith, and this based on the numbers I look at, this this is borne out. I think Smith has a wider range of outcomes than Waddle. Like he could fall lower than Waddle in the draft, and it's similar to thinking about Mac Jones. If Jones doesn't go number three, he could fall out of the top ten. You know. Um, and Smith could go as high as number six, but he could also go as low as number 20. Whereas Waddle, like, I think he could go as high as number six. I don't think he would fall much further than number 16, you know, and maybe he might not even fall that far. So like Waddle does have a, a higher draft floor, um, but really I do think it's so close to a 50-50 between these guys in terms of who goes first. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have a decent amount of evidence, whether it's, John Ross or uh, Henry Ruggs last year or something like that, that, you know, sometimes you just need one team to kind of fall in love with this dynamic yeah. potential and they end up going for it. It's not just like the Raiders are idiots. It, you know, there, there are other teams that will, <laughs> that, that will do this sort of stuff. And I think right. Waddle's like vastly better prospect than Henry Ruggs also. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so let's go a bit further. And again, let's talk about these quarterbacks now. So, what what are your thoughts about what's going to happen here? And do you even think about like trading out in this and that? Or are you just trying to figure out like in the back half of the of of the top ten picks? I think that's where really everything is interesting is going to happen because there could be teams coming up to there. It's feasible for a bunch of teams to get there. But is this a situation where maybe Trey Lance and Justin Fields are like Tua Tonga Vailoa and Justin Herbert, where teams are just going to say, you know what, uh, we're a little bit ambivalent on them and we'll sit back and let them fall to us. Yeah. So the Lions, I think, want to trade down. Um, okay. But at the same time, you know, teams might not be willing to trade up. Uh, you have the Broncos there sitting at nine. I think they would like a quarterback. Like they have scouted all of these guys pretty intently. Um, but at number nine, like why trade up to number seven <laughs> when you're just two picks away? So, yeah. uh, you know, that is the real, uh, for me, that's the point where the draft really starts 
uh, and thinking about what happens with the Lions. They would like to trade down. I don't believe they will take a quarterback. So if they stay, I think they go with Panay Sewell. If they trade down, I don't think it's to the Broncos. Uh, and then at that point, you have to kind of figure out who the trade partner is. Um, I would imagine, you know, potentially the Patriots, but I don't know if the Patriots want to trade up. And, you know, I don't know if they honestly need to. So in, in my mock drafts and how I'm projecting this, I will probably just stay put. I will probably have the board as is. Like, it's hard enough to predict the chaos of the NFL draft when you add more chaos to that and try to predict like how chaos will unfold, like predict the trades. I like I've studied and I've just sort of like scouted myself on like what works with previous mocks, what works when I try to do stuff. It never works out when I try to predict trades. Like I'm always more inaccurate when I try to predict trades. So I just kind of have to stick with the board and pretend as if that is what we're actually going to see on Thursday night. So I would say Lions right now, they're taking Panay Sewell if they stay. Um, they would probably like to trade out. Who knows if they actually can. Okay, so I think the I agree with the Broncos being kind of the most obvious choice for someone who you could point to everything that they have and say, this is a team that, that needs a quarterback. So I agree that, like, from my perspective, there wouldn't be necessarily a reason to, to move up, but maybe if they thought, like, they really prefer one of these guys versus the other guys. And I do think there's an interesting play here where, at least I'm looking at um, some some lines for for the Broncos at, at Bet MGM, where I see taking a quarterback is minus 110, taking uh, Fields is plus 400, and taking Lance is plus, plus 300. Any of those interest you at all? Yeah, I would need to look at the numbers a little bit, but you know, to take a quarterback at minus 110, that feels inflated, but Fields and Lance, like I do think there's a pretty good chance the Broncos end up with one of those guys. Um actually, let me Yeah, I mean if you take those two, you combine those really cool. together, it's like a 45% uh, uh probability between the two of them, whereas if you just take the minus 110, then that is that is like, you know, a 52.4%. So if you yeah. think that this definitely be between those two, then you're getting a little bit of value betting those two versus betting the quarterback alone. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think that there's maybe, mm, I think there's greater than a 50% chance that they take a quarterback. Yeah. Um, and if they do, I think it's going to be one of those two guys. I, I think it's, it's Fields or Lance. Uh, and so if it's 300 and 400, if those are the numbers you gave, uh, I think that's that's pretty good value. I'm gonna look at that after we're done with the podcast. <laughs> okay, yeah. Hopefully it was a, it doesn't it doesn't move uh, until that point. Okay, so I think that's all interesting. Now let's open up a little bit here. Um, are there any more obscure things you're looking at? Whether it's like first defender taken because this is a very strange draft here. We're gonna talk about eight, nine of the top ten picks. A uh, particular player. A lot of people are talking about. Patrick Satan going to the the Giants potentially or other things that are or the Cowboys excuse me or other yeah. or other teams around that area um I anything else when we're talking about top 10 ish that, that you're interested in before we start looking at the the rest of the draft yeah so number eight you know the Panthers are putting out some smoke that they might be interested in a quarterback and I I tend to think that that's more of a smoke screen so that maybe they can get a team to trade up although honestly like I could see them taking a quarterback. I know they just traded for um, Sam Darnold, but it's not as if they gave away all that much for him. Like it was, it was primarily a second rounder in next year's draft. Like they could still take a quarterback. Um, and I think Justin Fields would be the guy if, if they do that. So that is one that I'm kind of bouncing around in my brain, but if they stay, I think it's likely that they go with either, Rayshon Slater, or um, I've heard J.C. Horn is like a cornerback that they are really high on, uh, like, you know, above uh, Patrick Sertain. So there's a possibility that Horn could be the first defensive player drafted. I think they would probably go Slater before Horn, but like that's not really locked in. Uh, and then at number 10, the Cowboys, like Sertain is just like the guy that has been locked in there as like in every mock draft. It's just like the Cowboys, they're taking Sertain. Uh, it's an open secret that they like him. Although like um, I think there is some internal debate 
between Sertain and Horn. And I think they lean more towards Sertain, but um, that's not for sure. And there's the possibility that Slater falls to them at number 10. And so then there's the question, do they go with an offensive lineman? Like they need an offensive lineman. Uh, and Slater has the, the functionality of being able to play tackle or play guard. Uh, or do they go with Sertain? Um, I probably still lean towards Sertain, but there's a chance they, they go with an offensive uh, lineman. And so if Sertain slips past the Cowboys, that will alter a lot of mock drafts. Like that is kind of a tipping point uh, in terms of how a lot of this will unfold. Like if he goes past the Cowboys, his, his over under is 10 and a half. And so like going past the Cowboys, that will break the, the over under, but then also just like the cascading effect that that would have in mock drafts. Like for me, that's kind of the tipping point. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think, I think that's, that's a place where do you think there's any chance that Sir Jane is not the, is not the, the number one cornerback? Yes. Here? Okay. Yes. Like okay. the, the mocks lean towards him, but there's significant buzz on horn. And like, I've manually like calibrated. Um, I, I think Sir Tan maybe has like a 65% chance uh, and horn a 35% chance. But like it, honestly, like each day I think about it more and I bump the percentages just a little bit more towards Horn. You know, what's interesting about cornerback now, maybe if you studied this a little bit more that you would have a different opinion, but it, for, just anecdotally, I feel like unless you have that one complete sort of cornerback and despite how awful he was last year, like Akuda probably fits into that, into that sort of thing last year. You know, if you want to go back to a prototype, like Jalen Ramsey type, something like that, like those guys are obviously going first, but once you start to get into prospects that are in, they're not necessarily top 10 picks, uh, teams kind of can, can be all over the place with who they're going with, with cornerbacks. You see some, you see some teams reach for guys um, in the middle of, in, in those teen areas where you're kind of like, really? I don't, I, I don't, like, that's not how it would rank order. It doesn't seem to be as closely aligned in rank ordering as some of the other positions, at least for me. And that makes sense because I feel like it's a very, um, like, a, it's a very, like, pick who you, pick, pick trait sort of thing. Right. It's, it's, it's not it's as easily defined. Dependent. It's It's yeah. like, does, is this guy a press corner or is he like more of a zone? Like, how does he fit within our scheme? So, yeah, I think it is the kind of thing where, after a certain tier, uh, coaches will pick the guys based on how they fit into their scheme versus maybe overall talent, assuming that they think that those guys are all in the same tier. And so, yeah, like last year, you had Akuda number three, and then you had CJ Henderson as kind of like the clear number two corner in that class. But right. after him, there was just this sort of mess where it was like, okay, any of these three or four corners could be the next guy off the board. And uh, I do think that we have something a little bit like that um, where, you know, after Sertan, after Horn, like, I mean, Farley, if not for his injury, I think would be up there with those guys, but you could see how other corners end up jumping ahead of Farley. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like last year there was some, I'm trying to think of who it was. I mean, probably Damon Arnett was like, eh, I don't know. I remember the, the Raiders explanation on that one was like, we're just going to draft our guy. That, no matter, that one no was out there, but like, like AJ Terrell, AJ Terrell, again, when you had like CD lamb and some other people available. And again, so yeah. So I, I think like that, that's an interesting spot for there to be some weirdness going on there. Um, okay. Let me, let, let me, I'm going to jump into my galaxy brain running back take here. Okay. You, you, so you, you talk me off on this. Cause I don't know if you agree with this. So, uh, my thought, here's my overarching thought that, 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 that brought me into this is that in this year where it's a strange year, because well, as I already said, there's not like a, a lot of high end defensive talent. Um, it's, it's, it's talent rich at the top. I think teams are very concentrated at, 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 at these top guys. And then you have all the, the, the opt outs the shortened seasons, the inability to do all the sort of the, 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 the sort of work that you would like to do maybe to, to get in and really be confident in these guys. So as confidence goes down generally, I think positions that are more likely to quote unquote hit uh, maybe can rise up despite the fact that they don't have that much value. So I could see this weird thing happening where teams who need running backs, and there are teams who at least think they need <laughs> they need running backs in the second half of the first round, that they could say, you know what, 
guys like Najee Harris, guys like ETN, even guys like Javante Williams to a degree, but especially those first two guys as seniors who had like long track records of of excellent of of, of you know high end play, they could say, mm-hmm. you know what, let's just take him now because that. That second tier of running backs, we don't know what's going it's on nasty. there. We're not yeah. too happy about that, right? So yeah. let's just go ahead and take them now because we have less certainty. And in the second round, we can throw more darts at these other positions that we also have needs for. So I'm wondering if like over even one and a half running backs and things like that may be interesting places to look, um, assuming some teams could could move up and lock that in. And you know, I, I don't know about Harris versus ETN. I think... I think it's a coin flip-ish sort of thing. So maybe there's some value on ETN. I'm a little bit less confident there. I'm more confident that more running backs could go early than we think will go early. Early meaning first round. That, um, I I think that's fair. And I I can see, yeah, with the idea of, let, let me look and see what I've bet so far. So early on, early being uh early April, uh, I, I took under one and a half running backs at minus 200. Yeah. Um, I still think that's a good number, right? You know, like 66% break even rate. I would say that there's better than a 66% chance that we see under one and a half running backs in round one. But I don't think that number is as good now as I did a couple of weeks ago. Um, like a couple of weeks ago, I would have said it's maybe like an 80% chance that we see um, we see under one and a half. Now, I think it's probably closer to 75% maybe, because I I do agree with the premise uh, of your take there that um, with less confidence, people are going to be more inclined, one, to sort of just take their guys, but then also like take what they view as sort of like a sure thing. And even though we might think that running backs are kind of replaceable, uh, I think we have a pretty strong sense of what Harris and ETN specifically will be as professionals in the NFL. And then again, like Javante Williams, uh, a lot of teams are also pretty high on him too. Uh, And then that second tier after them, like it's nasty at the running back position. So like the scarcity at the position that on its own could drive more guys into the first round. So uh, I can, I can see it. Uh, I can see, I can see, you know, especially if a team like the Bucks, if they're like, look, I mean, if they basically pull the Chiefs, like what the Chiefs did last year, they look at their team, they're like, we're bringing back all of our starters. We're in a Super Bowl window. We have a pick here. What can we do to upgrade immediately one of the positions on the field? Honestly, the only pick they could do to make an immediate upgrade on a starter is running back. You know, like if they bring in Etienne, if they bring in Harris, that guy is an immediate upgrade on Lombardi Lenny, you know? Yeah. But that's the only way they can immediately upgrade in the first round. Yeah. I mean, that that, that thinking, of course, I hate that thinking. Like, again, this is not what I I do not endorse. This does not represent the opinions of uh, Kevin Cole or PFF, Uh, these these (laughs) sorts of these sorts of draft picks. Uh, But like listen, the Chiefs are an interesting one because I, I, I like to point to that when people talk about the Bucks and their like the luxury pick, the quote unquote luxury pick. Like the Chiefs had a luxury pick last year, and now it's like Swiss cheese roster. Like people are talking about they need a wide receiver, they need uh, they needed offensive lineman, they need this, they need that. Like the luxury pick is an awful idea, but I agree there. What I'm more interested in is teams like the Jaguars and the um, and the Jets now. Like it sounds really dumb for the for them to be prioritizing a running back here, but there's this weird notion that the running back helps the quarterback or something like that, yeah. and they're drafting new quarterbacks, and they both are, they're they're both picking 33 and 34, and then if you look at where their their picks are in the end of the first round, one of them's at 23, one of them's at 25, like maybe and then and they're ahead right of some some other yeah. teams. Uh, the Steelers are right in between the two of them there. Um, and then th- there's also some teams, some some teams later on, like you're mentioning the Bills and the Bucks, who may be in there. Maybe they'll say, you know, like let's use our first round picks on these guys, and then then we can choose between the f- the three or four guys at other positions uh, a little bit later when we have those picks coming up on the road. Uh, that's another thought that I have. Again, I may be galaxy branding this though, uh, but th- this is just thoughts that I had on it. 
no i i mean i can see it that like right there 23 24 25 like if a running back goes in the first round that's where it's happening and and if one goes right then you could see another one go because like teams will be like okay one of the guys is off the board we need to be sure we get our guy he's not going to last till, till our second round pick yeah, yeah. And I, I kind of want to see three running backs go on the first round just so we can have like an explosion of takes, of takes that'll, <laughs> that'll go on there. And everyone will be annoyed at everyone else. Uh, like everyone, you know, everyone will be annoyed. Well, analytics Twitter will be annoyed at GMs. Everyone will be annoyed at analytics Twitter for talking about it so much. Fan bases will hate everyone else a little bit more. You have some good reactions for on all live draft broad- broadcasts. So I'm, I'm down with all that there. Uh, okay, so now looking at the rest of, like I said, we're going to this this first round, this back half of the first round sort of area. How do you play the back half of the first round? Do, do you want to take like these really outsized bets on one player to one team? Is there any attractiveness on, on those sorts of things? Or do you really just want to think about over-unders? Or do you want to think about, again, getting into these little more interesting ones where X number of players at a certain position? I think that's more where you're really looking at the back half of the first round and where you can maybe make some... Some, some some solid bets is saying, okay, I think this could slide this direction or slide that direction at a certain position rather than really throwing darts when it comes to particular players to particular teams. Yeah, right now I have uh, no no sense of where any of the players after 17 of like where they're going to land, like a player right. to team matchup, like – I, I'm not going to do well in that. Like, I just know I'm not going to do well in that. It's a little bit easier to match up uh, a position or a side of the ball with the team in the second half. And so like, for instance, uh, like Washington, you know, they're they're commonly mocked with a uh, an offensive tackle or a wide receiver, but also linebacker. And, you know, like very commonly linebacker and you can see like, Hey, they need a linebacker. Like their defense is fine, except for off ball linebacker. And in about half of the mocks, they go with a linebacker. And like, that's not to say that's what is going to happen, but that's to say that it's probably 50, 50 in terms of going offense or defense in the first round, especially if you think, okay, they need tackle, they need receiver. They can address those two positions on day two pretty easily with this draft, uh, with the tackle and and receiver class. Um, But it would be harder to get a linebacker they really like in rounds two and three. So you could see them easily going with the linebacker here. And at at BetMGM, you can get plus 200 for them to go defensive side of the ball and like plus 300 for them to go linebacker. Uh, That's like one specific bet that I think is pretty good there where you're kind of being a little more focused uh, in terms of like trying to match a position or a side of the ball to a team. But for the most part, it's harder to do that in the second half of the draft, uh, where I think it's a little bit better to approach the second half of the draft is with some of the overs and unders for particular players. Uh, I, I think often we see more value to the over because there are, there may be like 45 guys who could go in round one. And a lot of people will look and see a number that puts a guy at like 24 and a half to 27 and a half. And they'll be like, I think he's a round one guy, but it's like, not all of these guys can go in round one. So there just tends to be a little more value on the over for some of those guys who are on the the round one, round two borderline. And then also, as you mentioned, like number of players at a position to go in round one, the, the end of round one is where those props tend to be made or broken. Uh, and so something like wide receiver over under four and a half uh, defensive linemen, linebackers, some of those props, uh, you know, are a little more interesting to me and how you can sort of gauge what happens at the end of round one. Okay. Well, let's talk wide receivers because uh, number one, I don't really know anything about other uh, about defense. <laughs> positions so I could have some 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 bad takes at least some informed bad takes about wide receivers so the guys who are interesting there uh we already talked about you know your your Devonte Smith could fall but whatever we're putting him in the bucket where it's not like they're going to fall all the way out of, yeah. of wherever um so the guys we're talking about here are uh Rashad Bateman Elijah Moore Kadarius Tony who's like 
according to some people, he's going to go a lot earlier than you think. According to others, not really there. I mean, Rondell Moore, maybe. I don't know. I don't know what the situation is here. And then Terrace Marshall, um, you know what? Everyone's talking about these injury things. I haven't even investigated. What What is the injury stuff with Marshall? I mean, uh, is it, apparently, is, do we, you, apparently like a, there were, you know, I think some nicks in high school or whatever. And then uh -huh. he had a foot injury his sophomore season, which really did derail his sophomore season. Like before the yeah. foot injury, he was right there uh, with Justin Jefferson in terms of like production on the field. After the foot injury, he was like clearly hampered, wasn't himself again till like December. Uh, and then he had, um, I believe some sort of like shoulder nick or something, but like, I, I don't honestly think it's that big of a deal. Okay. Okay. So when the, the, the props on these are normally, you can see a four and a half, maybe a five and a half um, in some places. Any, any thoughts on those? Yeah. So obviously the big three at the top of the board, they're locked in. Yep. Uh, and then you have Bateman and Tony. Both of those guys are about coin flips, but better than coin flips. So we'll say like 55 to 60% to get into round one. Uh, and, you know, like regardless of whatever you think about Tony, like I think he's he's better than not in terms of like his chances of going in round one. And then after that, Elijah Moore is pretty close to a coin flip, maybe like 40, 45% to get into round one. Um, and then you have Terrace Marshall and uh, you know, Rondell Moore. I really don't think Rondell Moore has all that good of a chance, but like an outside chance. So like there are five guys um, who have a better than not chance of getting in Elijah Moore, who's got close to a 50, 50, and then Marshall and Rondale Moore, who both have a shot, uh, over four and a half, I think is a pretty decent number. You can find that around minus two fifty right now. And just based on how the, the board kind of breaks down, I think there's a pretty decent chance of that hitting, uh, with the wide receivers who are available. And then some of the teams who could be looking for a wide receiver, uh, so New Orleans at 28, Green Bay at 29, and then Baltimore either at 27 or at 31. The fact that, Bol that Baltimore, they need a wide receiver, and now they have two picks in the first round, I think that really amplifies the chances of over four and a half hitting because it's now much likelier that they are taking a wide receiver in round one. Now, how do you think about mock drafts in this sort of area? Because... It seems like there'd be less, I don't, I don't like the amount of confidence that you have in getting the player correct or the position correct, because sometimes I've seen like, for instance, uh, you know, like I follow the Browns a lot, right? So sometimes I've seen the Browns where they're like, when Sashi was there, they're like mocking running backs to, to them in the first round. It's just like, dude, that's not going to happen right. sort of thing. And I think they're, yeah. so here's, the, the Browns are interesting to me and I'm only going to bring them up because I just, because like, I think they are really a team and you don't see this being mocked at all. I think they're a team who needs a wide receiver, honestly, because of the fact that Odell Beckham is not reliable and he's potentially on his way out. Like Jarvis Landry was a guy who was super reliable, but then he wasn't last season. He's another guy they can get rid of. I mean, conceivably, there could be the best move for the team could be to have no Odell Beckham and no Jarvis Landry on that team next year. And what do they have left? I mean, they got some Rashard Higgins and some Donovan Peoples-Jones on there too. So I don't know. That was one where I was wondering if they could also sneak in there because a lot of people are projecting them to go linebacker or edge. They were, and then they got clowny. And if you think about from, from the, the offensive side of the ball, offensive line is fixed. Uh, the, the, the running backs are, are really good. The defense, like, I just don't think they're going to say, I'm going to spend this pick on a uh, off ball linebacker. That would be like, ugh, you know, from, from some analytics sort of, sort of standpoint, the quarterback, I mean, maybe they could go cornerback there. I think that that's like some position you could always need more depth on if they're not sold and they probably aren't sold on Grady Williams at, at this point. But what, what do you think about, what do you think about that for a possibility? If I'm going to go like, like maybe analytics darling Rashad Bateman to the Browns, which would be pick 26, which is right around where some, you can get some over unders. If you want to take the under on him at 26 and a half, you can get some good, some good numbers there. Yeah. So that is the wheelhouse for Rashad Bateman. Uh, a, a couple of things. One, you mentioned uh, sort of like thinking about mock drafts and how to use them. I will say, I think mock drafts tend to be pretty bad when it comes to landing um, a player to a team. 
right? Okay. That's like in predictiveness, like I've uh, learned the hard way. They're not too predictive in the outside of the top 10. They're not too predictive at that where they tend to be pretty predictive uh, in the aggregate is setting over unders for particular players. Uh, they like collectively tend to be pretty good at that. And they tend to be pretty good at setting over unders for, um, for position groups. So, you know, like if you see in like 75% of mocks that there are five defensive linemen going in round one, like that's, that's a pretty good indication that you're likely to see five defensive linemen in round one. And they also tend to be pretty good. At, and this, you know, like corresponds obviously with setting over unders for players, but they tend to be pretty good at ordering players within the same position group. So giving you a sense that this player should go ahead of that player at the wide receiver position. Um, now to your question about the Browns, uh, I think they probably go defense here. Like you're seeing that in like 95% of mock drafts. But again, there's a lot of group think in mocks. So I would say like the real percentage is probably like 70, 75% that they, they go defense. Um, Rashad Bateman, however, is the one offensive player I have seen mocked to the Browns. So maybe, maybe we actually do <laughs> see Rashad Bateman. Uh, not that I would bet it. Um, but, uh, in, in fact, if I had to take a side on his over under, I think, you know, it's anywhere from 24 and a half to 27 and a half. I would bet the over on that because I, I do think like the wheelhouse of where he goes is probably 28 to 31 within round one, if he goes in round one. Um, but Rashad Bateman, 26 to the Browns, like that could happen. I would say there's an underappreciated chance of that happening. Most people would probably think there's like a 1% chance of that happening. I think the real odds are probably like two or 3%. <laughs> Okay. So you're saying there's a chance. That's what I feel like. There, I'm, there, I feel like we're doing what I'm the... saying is it's, you know, like <laughs> two to three times likelier than your average mock drafter or average football fan would probably think. Yeah, yeah, no, this is definitely one of those takes where it's like, I, I'm, I'm like doing the fan thing here to try to figure out like, I want the team that I like to go with a player who who I like. I mean, I just think, I just think like Bateman's, I just think the guy's incredible, honestly. Um, so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see um, if, if anyone agrees with me there. All right, any, any, anything else we don't, uh, as far as different props that you're looking at or themes that you're looking at here? Um, maybe even, maybe some that could even dip into the, the beginning of the second round. Uh, one guy who's on the borderline of round one and round two is Trevon Morig, the safety out of TCU. Um, I think he's head and shoulders above all of the other safeties in this class. He won the Thorpe award last year as the, uh, you know, the top defensive back in the nation. Um, he's coming out as a junior. I'm yet to see, um, especially in any, mock of the past like month or two i'm yet to see a safety go ahead of him in any mock and if you look across the different big boards that are out there you know morig is typically in the 20s and 30s and then you know the the safeties who could potentially challenge him um you know like javon holland specifically richie grant those two guys you tend to see them more in the 40s and 50s um it's around minus 400 to, to bet on Trevon Morg to be the number one safety, which could seem fairly ridiculous of like, do I want to lay minus 400 on a guy to be the number one player at his position? But like, I think that's a slam dunk. Um, and specifically, like, if you look at Jamar Chase, like the, you could have bet, you know, minus 400 uh, a month ago for him to be the number one receiver. And you would love to be able to get those odds now. Like, I think it's a similar situation with Trevon Morig. Like he should be like minus a thousand to be the first safety and he's only minus 400. So I think there's like significant value on betting on him, whether or not he goes in the first round. I think there's a very good chance, like very, very good chance. He's the first safety off the board. And then another, another bet, well, just, just quickly on that yes. one, real fast. So I feel like that, if there was just intuitively, if there was like an if inefficiency, it would be uh, like very long, I guess very short odds um, having like people just don't want to bet that, right? They don't, they yes. don't want to lay a bunch to get, to get less. And then just looking at some mock draft data that I have here. Yeah. It looks like Morig is like 
maybe there's been a couple. Maybe I, 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 there might be one in here where, where like some random fan had one of these other guys to be earlier. Yeah. But yeah, it's not not a lot there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, I would say like ninety above ninety percent probability that Morig is the number one safety. It's weird. I feel like safety is actually a little bit more stable sometimes than cornerback has been. Also for for where 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 teams have these guys ranked. But go ahead. Yeah. It's because it's a, it's a harder position, I think. So yeah. like when one guy stands out at the position, he really stands out. Uh, so that, that's more, I would easily bet. And Kevin, to your point, you're absolutely right. Uh, where I have been the sharpest in betting uh, the NFL draft over the past few seasons is in seeing a guy who's a favorite, uh, but he's not favored by nearly enough. Yeah. And yeah. so it's easy to look at this number and be like, I don't want to bet that. And then like two weeks later, the number has significantly moved. And so just betting these guys who maybe have longer odds, who are clear favorites, like there, there often is value there just because they are not favored by nearly as much as they should be. Uh, and, and the next bet I have is another one in that vein under five and a half quarterbacks. Um, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Under five and a half quarterbacks. I think we get exactly five. Only once in NFL history have we had six, like that 1983 class uh, you know, of, of Hall of Famers. I do not think we are going to get a six quarterback in this class. Uh, in no recent mock draft uh, from Sharps have I seen a sixth quarterback. Uh, Peter Schrager, you know, uh, he's, he's great. When it comes to his final mock, he's pretty contrarian uh, with some of his takes in his first mock. He had Davis Mills uh, out of Stanford uh, as the number six quarterback going number 32 to Tampa Bay in his first mock. In his second mock, he did not have Mills in there. Uh, so like, we're not going to see, I would say like 99% probability, we are not going to see a sixth quarterback in round one. And so you can bet that around like minus 500. I would bet that to minus whatever. Like we are not going to see a, a, a sixth quarterback in round one. There's there's no clear quarterback who is like the number six guy in this class, right? And, and out of the big five, there's no one who's really gotten any round one hype. There are some guys who are getting second round hype, but I mean, even then that doesn't really mean much. And I should say, uh, Benjamin Robinson of Grinding the Mocks, he did a really great study at Football Outsiders last year where he looked at mock draft data and showed that um, relative to mocks, quarterbacks consistently fall down the board. And like, that makes sense to me that mock drafters would overhype quarterbacks and how they're projecting these guys to go. So think of Drew Locke a couple of years ago, everyone had him as a round one guy and he fell into round two, uh, even like a miniature version of that Dwayne Haskins, everyone had him as a top 10 guy and he fell to number 15. So like, what would be liker, likelier for us to get one of the big five falling out of round one or for us to get a sixth quarterback who hasn't been mocked into the round one going in the first round? Like, I think it's likelier we'd have a quarterback fall out of round one than for us to get a sixth quarterback. So like, I'm, I'm all in on under five and a half quarterbacks. Again, like minus 500, minus 600, it, it doesn't matter. I would bet this at minus 2000. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I love this, and I think, like you mentioned, normally there's at least like this is the this has been the most half-hearted, maybe not even half-hearted, like more like one-tenth-hearted effort to try to throw someone into the first round is maybe maybe this guy could, like normally there's something around guys yeah. that you could get excited yeah. about, like when guys like Jordan Love go, you know, there's a lot of buzz about these guys, you know, there's a lot of buzz about, about these guys maybe being like. Could he go in the top 10 or something like that? And then they end up going at the, the second half of the first round. I, I mean, I, it's not out there as a bet, but I, I'd love to bet like that no one even no one even goes to the second round. Like, I don't think any of these guys necessarily even go in the, in the second round, honestly. And they may fall even even further um, outside of those top five big quarterbacks. So, yeah, I think that's, well, hey, that's a good you, one. You could bet that uh, not effectively like that, but you could say like you could take the overs on all yeah. of these other quarterbacks, like the over on Kellen Mond, the over on Davis Mills, the over on uh, Kyle Trask. Uh, because I would say if you bet the overs, just blindly bet the overs on those three guys, I bet at least two of them hit and maybe all three of them hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like people are up and, you know, they're, they were up in arms about like Jalen Hurts going in the second round and like these guys are just... Eh, you know, I don't, there's not a whole lot there. I, mean, I don't mind Kellen Mond if you want someone want to take like a, a dart throw on him in the third or fourth round or something like that. But I don't know. Yeah, I just can't see anyone spending premium 
draft capital, um, especially at the like at the end of the second round. I guess the the one the one thing that people are going to point to is the the Bucks maybe looking for a successor sort of thing. Yeah. I think that's always overhyped. I feel like that it it never it never happens, and then the the Packers did it, and it like blew up in their face. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> massive blow up in the face, sort of, sort of, sort of thing. Like there were like five years in a row, people were, were talking about drafting Drew Brees as successor, and it just and they continued to trade up for like players that they never should have been throwing away picks for. Yeah, two more guys I want to talk about. Sure, who, they're not going in, in round one at all, but wide receivers. So uh, up up your alley, you've written pieces on both of these guys, Amon Ross, St. Brown. His uh-huh. over under right now is ninety eight and a half that feels too high. I think he, I think he will end up going pretty securely in rounds two and three. Uh, I mean, he's like, he's like at least a 200 pounder in a class that doesn't have a lot of those other than project guys later on. Yeah. Yeah. And and he produced consistently in college, you know, right away. So, uh, you know, early, early declare, I think he probably goes more around like pick 60, or something like mm-hmm. that. Like, I think he's on the borderline of rounds two and three, not rounds three and four. I like that. So I would take the under there. And then Seth Williams is a guy who stands out. Uh, his over under right now, I believe is 136 and a half. And so that, you know, puts him more on, you know, round four. Uh, I think he's probably more like on the round three, round four borderline. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if he even like went at the end of round two. But like, I, I think he probably goes in round three. And so I think there's still like around pick a hundred, something like that. So if he's around 136 right now, I think there's, there's value in betting the under on him. I like Williams a lot. I feel like there's this weird thing where some people have gotten entranced by Anthony Schwartz there and the fact that he's so fast, but the guy like never caught the ball down the field, so yeah. um, I don't know about super fast guy who hasn't displayed the ability to track the ball downfield. I think that maybe it's taken away from some of them. I mean, I actually comped him pretty high up to to Alshon Jeffrey, which obviously he's not going to go nearly as high as someone like like Alshon Jeffrey. But he, again, he's another bigger guy who hit some thresholds for his production. He's not like an awful producer. Um, and he was, he, he, he is tested well enough, especially when we're talking about explosion sorts, sorts of he's drills. He's got good and, athleticism. And, and, and again, in, in the end zone type of guy, yeah, I see him as being like a good complimentary receiver. So those, those are guys that, that I'm high and probably higher relative to market on, on Williams than, than on St. Brown. But I, I think, I think if we're just going to talk about market, yeah, I think both of those are, are looking pretty sweet. And any other ones you want to throw out here before we wrap things up? No, I, I think that's good. Actually, you know what? There, there's a series of bets that you could make. Let me make sure I have the book right. Uh, I believe it's at FanDuel where you can bet on the exact order of uh, players to go uh, yeah. and specifically running backs. And so I think there's some value looking further down the board on betting. I mean, there's a very clear top three, you know, we, we talked about them, Harris, Etienne, Javante Williams, uh, on betting the order outside of what we would typically expect. Like if you bet Harris, Etienne and Williams, that's very chalky. That's the order in which they are likelier to go. But right. with running backs, who really knows, you know, like it, it's, it wouldn't be a surprise at all to see Etienne go ahead of Harris. Right. And so if you bet on it or to see Williams go ahead of Etienne. So if you bet on any of the non like Harris, Etienne, Williams orders for those three guys, I think there's some significant value there. Like I think those are mispriced at FanDuel. So for instance, Javante Williams, Najee Harris, Travis Etienne, 60 to one. Like that's not likely to happen, but it's 60 to one. I, I think you're getting in pretty good there. I'm sorry. Which which one was that one? You talking about Javante then first on that one? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, Williams, Harris, Etienne, sixty to one. Yeah, yeah. I I think that's interesting. Uh, I'm surprised looking at these honestly that Harris, Etienne, Gainwell, and Harris, Etienne, Carter are shorter odds than Harris, Etienne, Sermon. Yeah. Am I wrong in thinking that Sermon is like should should be prioritized over those other guys? Uh, 
I I think Sermon goes later than Gainwell and Carter. You do? Interesting. Because I, I thought maybe he was like, he had that 210 pounds. He had those two high-profile games, the, uh, that sort of situation, that maybe he could fit at least the, you know, the other guys would be more interchangeable in some people's minds. Yeah. Based on the uh, the big boards that I tend to look at, and they're like they, they have predictive value historically – I think Gainwell and Carter go ahead of Sermon. Like I think they're day two guys, and I think Sermon is more on the round three, round four borderline. So like I don't like I understand Gainwell and Carter going ahead of Sermon. What I think is horrible in all of this is Gainwell and Carter going ahead of Javante Williams <laughs> in any sort of combination of this stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because I mean, yeah, we're talking about like plus 340 on gain well like it's almost it's just, it's really up there yeah. um it's it's like it's higher than i mean it's shorter odds than etn harris williams which is like yeah. why would that why would that be the case so it's, it's yeah, maybe, maybe just those are just way off as opposed to sermon right. being a value exactly where he those is. Yeah. those are way off all of these are way off uh in in multiple ways you know like the the ones that have williams harris and etn grouped together all of those are too long for the most part. And the ones that have anyone outside of those three guys, those odds are too short. Yeah. You know, I was pretty big on Williams earlier in the process. Um, he he kind of gained value from there, but it's, it's really lost momentum as far as him potentially being the, you know, slipping into the first round or number one guy. Like a lot of that stuff has kind of lost momentum now. I don't know if it's... Um, his pro day was one of those things where when he weighed in at 212 and he ran in the, you know, four fives that that might have dissuaded some some people because it's funny because even uh, our, our man PFF Mike here, Mike Renner, he had a quote that we put on social media about Javante Williams is a bigger uh, Alvin Kamara. And it's like uh, he's actually <laughs> weighed less than Alvin Kamara did. So it's like. I think that took a lot out of his sales. Like if he would have hit 220, even at five, five something, I don't think people would have cared, but I'm wondering if he lost some momentum there. Um, Cause it'll be just interesting to see what that playing style, what ends up happening in, 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 in the pros or where people, how people feel about him. Yeah. Um, I think he still has some, some hype within the league. Like I okay. think there, there are still some teams that have him number one on their board which like, I don't really agree with that, but you know, I, I think it, it doesn't really matter. Um, there are, there are enough teams that like him for him to have a real shot of somehow going as the number one, number one back. Like it's not likely to happen. The likeliest is Harris, but he has a shot. Yeah, I mean, it makes has... sense. We saw, we saw like Edward Hilaire move up. We've seen success of yeah. guys like Kareem Hunt and other tackle breaker types. I do feel like the, the, the tackle breaking force miss tackles has become a big thing and teams are paying a lot more attention to that. Um, yeah. Even prioritizing, you know, like Devin Singletary was drafted. I mean, whatever, it was the third round. It wasn't a big deal, but whatever. So he was drafted and then, you know, David Montgomery and other guys that have moved up based upon the, that same sort of skill set. So it definitely has a priority within the NFL. I just don't know. I just wish he would have, if he could hit a few more marks on that pro day, I would have felt really, really great about him potentially going number one. Yeah. Yep. All right, man. I think uh, I think we wrapped it up. Uh, we figured everything out. I know. Uh, ideally, you'd want everyone to be on all of these things like a month ago, but you know, we're getting a lot of information here. Draft should be uh, super exciting. What do you What do you want to plug here for what for what you got going on? You mentioned, and I've been using it and looking at it, and I think it's excellent. Here is that you have you have tracking here for the NFL draft, all the different props here. You have your own portfolio as part of that. Anything else you got going on uh, for the NFL draft? You guys doing a live stream? I do not believe we are doing a live stream, which uh, thank God, because I don't, I don't want to be on camera that, that whole time. Uh, but so I have my, my top 100 big board uh, live at action. I have uh, my pre-draft top 40 uh, rookie dynasty rankings uh, with write-ups for most of the players. Uh, and then during the draft, we will be releasing updates uh, and then, of course, on Monday after the draft, I will have my you know post-draft top 50 rookie dynasty rankings. So be sure to keep an eye out for all of that. Yeah, it was an exciting time, uh, a time of hope throughout the NFL because like literally every team has gotten better. At least they think they've got, they've gotten better at this point as you've jettisoned all the bad players and brought in new players to fill all those holes. So 
Uh, thank you so much again. Thir- three-time guest. Uh, your, your prize is in the mail for that. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in. Go ahead, rate, review the pod, and then we'll be talking post-draft to discuss where all the landing spots and uh, how to look at these guys. I think I'm going to concentrate a little bit on a fantasy perspective next week for how, how to look at these guys. But thanks, everyone, for tuning in.